Okay. Okay, everybody, today is another adventure with Nancy Atardo. As you can see, I look like I'm in a very exotic place. Uh, Nancy's also in an exotic place called Rochester, New York. Right. And uh, here in Florida, we're dying from the heat, so that would be very nice to be up there. Uh, but I'm I'm not in Mexico. I look like I am, and I I think uh, many of you know or have heard the name Cuenavaca in relation to Lindbergh, uh, Anne, and Charles Lindbergh. And this is a photograph that I took in Mexico City about five years ago. Uh, Cuenavaca is now a, a restaurant the embassy. And this is my photograph of the lovely swimming pool. Of course, Charles and Anne were not married at the time in 1929 when they met here, and he couldn't have thrown his baby into this swimming pool, but he probably swam in it. It's quite lovely. So Nancy, how are you? And what are we going to talk about today? This book. I'm great, Ronnell. Thank you. Yes. What a book that is. This is Crime of the Century. But it had another title, Airman and the Carpenter by Ludovic, Sir Ludovic Kennedy. He was knighted by somebody. I guess it was Queen Elizabeth. Anyway, I don't like royalty. That's why. <laughs> okay, so Sir Ludovic Kennedy uh, wrote this uh, fabulous book. A movie was made from it. And Nancy has scoured it for clues. And she's going to tell me and all of us, uh, all of you, what she found in this book. But we'll have to do part two, part three. <laughs> Don't know how, how many yeah. parts, Nancy. Uh, what have you got? Okay. It's good to see you, Ron, now. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Have a dip in my swimming pool. Oh, Ronnell, right after the Zoom, I'll be there. <laughs> I, I'll grab my suit and be there. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, Ronnell, I thought we'd do a little show and tell. Okay. On eBay, I discovered a photo of Charles Lindbergh depicted in a stained glass window. I'm it's okay. in Springfield, Massachusetts at the Methodist, the Trinity Methodist Church there. And this is uh, the photo I'll show you is the photo I bought from eBay. Uh -huh. I have my own actual photos because Sam and I made a trip there just to see, to see the, just to see the the stained glass. Absolutely, there absolutely. Are no photos that you could have looked at instead of driving all the way there. Let's see. Oh no, you know he has to be in person. <laughs> oh my goodness! There he is in the center. How about that? That's this amazing. was put up in in 1928. It says underneath he was responsible for connecting, I think, the world or something like that. Right. That's why he, he he achieved his sainthood. So yeah. the the building was built in 27 or 28, and they probably right that vintage. It's a beautiful, beautiful stone church. Uh huh. How big is that window? Is it like? 20 feet high or oh I bet 15 feet high that's what I would guess yeah is it in a prominent position in the architecture or is yes. it I was nervous that it was going to be way up high and I wouldn't be able to take my own photograph of it but it was just a perfect position it's just right around the with the others around the sides of the church yeah wow so that was a good trip you think that's the only church that put him in the windows? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. I think I think that's enough. I mean, as a piece of art, it's lovely, but um, yeah, this is always lovely, you know. But yeah. <laughs> okay, so this I'm referring to, um, Ronell. I. I'm referring to an article that I cut out in 1997 from our local newspaper, okay? Um, and I had started my, my Lindbergh research in 1993 with the Algren um, and Menir book. So I cut this out because of Lindbergh. This is why I cut it out. I know that. 
But this is from Ludovic Kennedy's book, oh, really? Crime of the Century. There it is. That started everything. Yeah, and they've never changed the cover of their book. It's always this orange, uh, reddish. Absolutely, orange. yes. But Ludovic Kennedy's book comes in hardcover, Airmen and Cars. Yes, yeah. yes. Here's yeah. Airmen. Here's the oh. first right. volume. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, sorry. I so, so Ludovic Kennedy says, listen to this. Yeah. Um, this is talking about the baby's sleeping suit that arrived at John Condon's house. Um, Lindbergh examined it carefully, particularly the number of buttons and flaps and declared unequivocally that it was the suit Charlie had been wearing on the night he was taken. Yeah, but you and I both know and everyone listening to, well, my, not everybody realizes he wasn't there when they put the baby to sleep. And how was he going to know how many buttons or flaps or how? Uh, so the answer someone like Steve Romeo would give, you know, would be, well, he asked his wife and she told him, but. But all Dr. Denton said the same number of buttons and the same number of flaps. Did. Oh, okay. But there were no. So, so, so that's a just a bunch of garbage. Okay. Yeah. So here we have my clipping from, this is from 1997. This is about Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. Okay. This starts off the review. It's a book review. Um, a young Billy Graham, well on his way to becoming America's best known preacher was in Los Angeles, preparing to fill yet another revival tent with thousands of fans and seekers. When he noticed a relative cradling an infant and asked, whose baby is this? It was Graham's. It was Billy Graham's baby. He didn't recognize it. Yes. Let's think that if Billy Graham can't recognize his own child, <laughs> how is Charles Lindbergh supposed to recognize a Dr. Two Denton's sleeping suit? It's not. A number two. Yeah, it's not a good identification because it's the mother and the nurse who should have identified it. That or Betty Gao. Betty Gao knew the Betty ba baby even better than right. and And the problem is it wasn't a custom-made couturier sleep. Oh, no, no, no. No. Something so. you could buy in Gimbel's or Macy's, and there were lots of those. And how did he know that that was the one that his son was sleeping in? What differentiated that suit from another? Right. And that's yeah. why the evidence at the trial as well, the same thing applies. How is Anne expected to recognize the sleeping suit? I mean, you know what I mean. Well, yeah. everyone listening to us understands right. this is not legitimate uh, evidence to put somebody in the electric chair no so, so now we're going to go to let talk. me interrupt you one more time yeah. uh you also know you might have forgotten it took Lindbergh. i don't know this the sleeping suit came like uh at night so was, i don't know when he got it in the mail how did condon get it like six o'clock it took Lindbergh till two in the morning to show up. That's right. right? In disguise. Like two in the morning, right? Yeah. Right. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, now I'd like to talk about Scott Berg as, for a little bit, just a little bit, about Scott Berg as Lindbergh's um, rehabilitator. That's what he was. Mm. Okay. So now everybody who's involved in the case is used to seeing there's this is one of two pictures we're, we're all familiar with this one and we're familiar with this photo four of them together kathleen norris etc the whole group okay. okay so here's what Berg has to say about that henry loses time and life ran photographs of Lindbergh and his colleagues with their arms held high as they were reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. But well, you have to have your mouth open if you were spotting, citing, 
doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, their mouths are closed. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Their mouths are, well, somebody was reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and they were giving the stiff arm, but that, that isn't, you know, there's a big controversy over this because it was, pro I don't know how to say this. I mean, to all of us, to me, Lindbergh was a Nazi. There's no question in my mind, but you could argue on his behalf that that was, and I've forgotten the name of that salute because it was like a Boy Scout salute from like the late 19th century. Some, I forget the guy who invented that salute. Oh, but they were doing it in Madison Square Garden. It was most of the people in the America First Committee by that time were the remnants of the the Nazi American Bund, which was put, uh, Fritz Kuhn, uh, this is complicated, but the leader of the Nazi American Bund uh, was uh, put in jail for fraud. He went on trial. So the Nazi American Bund was put out of business. I forgot the year. And all of them, thousands of them joined the America First Committee. So it got to be infiltrated with lots of Nazi people, uh, pro-Nazis, fascists. And, uh, you know, there's so many books written about the America First Committee, one of which Lindbergh was pushing on his deathbed by Wayne Cole, C-O-L-E, the guy, I have the book here. So there's this controversy about that photograph that they weren't actually saluting Hitler, but they really were. I'm sorry, they really were. Not Norman Thomas. I don't think that's the guy next to Kathleen Norris. Uh, I don't know what was in their head. I don't know what these people were thinking when they were doing that. I don't understand it. Uh, there's that awful photograph, but it doesn't prove that they were saluting Hitler, not everybody in the stadium. That was Madison Square Garden. And there must have been 20,000 people in the audience, and that's the only picture. So we don't know if the whole audience of all the America First Committee members in that in Madison Square Garden, whether they were all doing that or the people on the stage were doing it. But let me tell you, I heard this, I read it somewhere, I cannot believe it, and I can't find it again. If you know where it is, let me know. John, before he died, Lindbergh's eldest son, living son, gave an interview in which he was asked about that picture. And somewhere I saw it, I hope I saved it in my computer, but his answer, you're not gonna believe, you won't believe it. He's saying to the interviewer, well, there was a lot of noise in the audience and my, my father was telling them to calm down. Yeah. Oh, that's a gem. I know, I, I read it somewhere. I couldn't believe, and I, I saved it, you know, it's buried somewhere in my laptop, but that's what he said in an interview that my father, because I don't think his children knew what he was there. They never had any part of their father's life. None of them, not even. Well, the thing is, if he was, they couldn't have been at the same time, simultaneously reciting the Pledge of Allegiance with them. and being loud yeah. but it was the pledge of allegiance at that moment uh, somebody was reciting it and it was you know these people back then in the 30s and early 40s they they like Lindbergh admired Nazi Germany for its cleanliness well you know what he says in his efficiency work. and all of that but yeah and its efficiency in it, in its it, scientific bent it's, very they, efficiently, they murdered millions of people. Yes, yes, yes. Henry Ford efficiently made cars, and Hitler efficiently made death. That's that's right. the efficiency. Right. Of, uh, yeah. Well, now I'm I'm looking back at Berg, and I'm seeing about what he thought about actual Nazis. Okay. Well, the, uh, yeah, Berg Berg deals with it very. That's why I wrote that letter uh, about the movie. This is a, another thing I've never discussed in any of these videos, but Berg uh, whitewashed Lindbergh's interest in Nazi Germany. He really did. And, and he talks about 
about, of course, when Lindbergh got the service cross of the Golden Eagle, we've got to talk about um, Hermann Goering. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, uh, Burke talks about him as presenting himself as the Third Reich's Renaissance man. Goering presented himself yes. to Lindbergh as the Renaissance man. Well, but Goering also presented himself as the Third Reich's Renaissance man. Well, he was the second in command after if Hitler died, yes. Goering was the second in charge. Right. Yeah, right. I don't Hitler know. Considered him my paladin. Mm -hmm. Paladin meaning a knight renowned for heroism and chivalry. Right, because he was the World War One. He was a head of the uh, the Luftwaffe. And all as a Renaissance man, all Goering did was simply borrow, in quotes, uh, tapestries, Madonnas, and other objets de art that he had borrowed from German museums. So I guess this Nazism isn't so bad when you have a Renaissance man second in charge, right? So that's Berg's take. Well, who knows? Oh, and here's Berg's take on eugenics. What is okay. that? What is it's his his take on eugenics? Is we're talking about Dr. Carell and Lindbergh when they're um, they're together, and I think they're on they're both their islands off of France, off of Brittany. And sitting in the doctor's high walled garden or by the fireplace late into the night, the two men discussed improving qualities within the human species and the population at large through diet and reproduction. Yeah. But now, isn't that cousin. fine? I mean, so you eat well and you don't marry your first cousin. Now, what is wrong with eugenics? Why are people writing a whole book about Lindbergh, the immortalist, if eugenics are just simple? Do a nice diet, eat bran and get your fruits and vegetables, and then uh, reproduction, don't marry your first cousin. But what are you saying? You're commenting about Berg's take on on Lindbergh's relationship with Carell, is that what you No, mean? on how simple eugenics is. It's a simple matter of diet and eugenics, um, diet and reproduction. It's nothing more than that. No, but you know, well, the they, it's called social Darwinism. They took Darwin's theory of evolution and um, humans have been, uh, cl uh, creating perfect animals for, for since time began, uh, prettier birds, faster horses. So the idea of Francis Galton, who was Darwin's cousin, after Darwin died, he came up with this. He was a genius. The guy was brilliant, but he came up. A, a lot of brilliant people have cuckoo ideas. They're wackos. Just because they're brilliant in science doesn't mean. So Francis Galton uh, uh, created this idea that uh, we can perfect humans. And that's how it came to be. So the British and the Americans took this up. And Hitler followed it, and but but you're bringing this up because it's in Berg's book. How and Berg doesn't agree with eugenics. So if he's talking about Lindbergh and Carell sitting by the fireside, we know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're talking about a master race, a race without color, exactly. Yellow. But I think he's got very very few references in he his does. book. Right, because see the whole the whole thing about Berg's book is that he was family authorized. The family hired him through Jim Newton, who was Lindbergh's. Uh, people don't even know about Jim Newton. He's hardly basically is one of his best friends besides Harry Guggenheim. Exactly. Well, Guggenheim wasn't as close to him as Jim Newton was. So, you know, Jim Newton got the family together over here in Fort Myers and they brought Berg over and they all liked him. Uh, it's very complicated. And um, 
so Scott Berg got the okay to he got the authorization to go to Yale and he claimed that he was the only biographer of Charles Lindbergh to be authorized to do such a thing because those papers have been locked up until 50 years after I think 50 years after the death of Lindbergh which uh wait a minute he died in 74 is it 50 years yet it's almost 50 wait a minute I never thought of this that's so, right. We're coming goodness. upon the, the 50 yeah. year anniversary. Goodness, 26 and 23 is 49. Oh, next year. It should we'll be. We'll all gather yeah. at New Haven, Connecticut, won't we? Yippee. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, wow. They're going to have such a line around the Sterling Library. <laughs> It'll be crazy. I've been there, but Lisa Perlman uh, evidently went. Lots of people went. I never tried. I figured whatever's in there is not the clue to who kidnapped and killed the baby. It's not going to be in that library. The oh, no. are not there. No. You know um, I mean? Lindbergh probably owned the first shredder ever developed <laughs> so none of those letters to his his female friends in germany are going to be oh in but, the library. Something, but let me explain something it's very interesting Anne's letters will be available next year and she's got the name hessheimer in the finding aid do you know what a fire let me explain to people who don't know what if they've never been to an archive you go online and you let's say you're interested in uh, Mr. Smith's archival papers. You go on, you go into the university where it's being held, like the Library of Congress or the Yale Library, and you look for the finding aid. In the case of Anne and Mara Lindbergh, I think it's about 60 or 100 pages long. It's enormous, her finding aid, the finding aid meaning. It's the cataloged version of what's in her papers. There's oh, okay, okay. boxes. Um, there's got to be over 900 to 1,000 boxes of memorabilia that Lindbergh personally put there because he was, talk about Berg reconstructing Lindbergh. Lindbergh reconstructed Lindbergh because yes. he put stuff in there for posterity to put stained glass. Why is there a stained glass window in a church? Because people, he wanted to keep on being thought of that way. And you've got to rip up every bad thing about you. You've got to- And, and then maybe, maybe you write a book that's <laughs> published posthumously that says autobiography of values. Exactly. Right? That'll yeah. do a nice job on yourself. I got news for you. The spirit of St. Louis is a pack of lies also when he got, okay. um, because of my friendship with Ray Fredette, who uh, kept explaining to me that Lindbergh could not have remembered anything to oh. write that book in 1954 it was published i think in 54 and they made the movie out of it it's a according to him it was all a bunch of lies that Lindbergh made up simply because everybody was dead by 1954 who could have challenged him on the flight to paris so Lindbergh was familiar with making with making things look a certain way and uh so what i'm saying about the yale finding aid. The finding aid is the document. You can see them online. You go to the university. There is Walter Winchell's, or he's I'm making up a name now. Uh, they put their archival documents at a university, and then the, uh, what are they called, the archivists, they have to catalog all these papers, put them in folders <clears throat> and files, and that's that's how they create the finding aid. So, I got away from the reason that I brought this up. And oh, Hessheimer. You were talking about finding Hessheimer. Exactly. If you go to the Yale Universe, uh, Yale Sterling Library website for the Lindbergh uh, papers, and you look up Anne Morrow Lindbergh, there's the name Hessheimer, Hessheimer, H-E-S-S-H-E-I-M-E-R, -E -E in her files. It's there. So either Anne knew about someone named Hessheimer or they put it there after she died. I don't know, but it's there. It's listed in the finding aid. And next year, when her papers are available to the public, free for all. Everybody can go and 
and uh, I suppose you make an appointment and you, yeah. So there's a question about all of this with the children, you know, did Anne know? She must have known he was doing something. He was never home. Well, he was never home from the beginning, though. Right. You know? He was not a marriage. She uh, was so passive about in that marriage. Yeah, his yeah. he wasn't a marriageable kind of a guy. No, he certainly wasn't. He wasn't. He wanted to have a lot of children, but he didn't want to raise them. No, he didn't want to raise them. He paid for them very, very, okay. Well, we're getting, we're talking about Lindbergh the person, but we, you and I think Lindbergh had something to do. I don't know if, how you think about Lindbergh's, um, uh, Lindbergh's participation in the death or the disappearance of his son. I don't know if you think it was uh, like Algren and Monier said it was an accident that he covered up for. He didn't mean to kill the child, but uh, I think Gregory Algren is may have changed his mind, but I have to get a hold of him. Yeah. I have to make another video with Gregory Algren and find out what he thinks today. You yeah, his 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 video you did with him before was terrific wasn't it well yeah i loved watching it yeah he'll come back because i can't get a hold of him oh okay Very busy. but in this book that you and i uh read to become so interested in the case um you and i believed it was an accident until we started realizing there was oh, yeah minutes, right is that when you absolutely yeah it, so it, yes, but, it, but it was a big deal. It named Lindbergh as the is the one who right. who was responsible for the abduction of the child, whether it was a prank or whatever, an accident. Yes, it named Lindbergh. That was the big deal. Yeah, and, and it and it gave so many oddities about Lindbergh's behavior. No bloodhounds, no this, no that. It was it was chilling. It was actually chilling. It wasn't just that he bungled the investigation because he was dumb or ignorant about... He just refused to allow people who could... Think about it. Wasn't Al Capone better than Mickey Rossner and Bits and Spitali? I mean, if you're going to get the mob into, if you're going to get the the mob to help you with your missing child, don't you want to go to the top notch mobster? <laughs> Al Capone was begging to help, and and wouldn't you want to go to Al Capone if well, Spitali and Bits had more clout in the underworld than Al Capone did? It makes no sense. So it when, makes no sense. And you know, there's a funny thing um comparing crime of the or airman and the car carpenter or crime of the century, same book, and Berg's book. Uh -huh. Because after I read Ludovic Kennedy's, I absolutely had to go back to Berg's book. Why? What, what um, do you mean about well, because Kennedy Kennedy says that. There were four colonels involved in the investigation. There was Colonel Lindbergh, Colonel Breckenridge, Colonel Schwarzkopf, and Colonel Wild Bill Donovan. Okay. Oh. So so Kennedy's book said that Donovan, and I have my card here of how that all worked. Donovan knew Donovan's underling was Thayer, Robert Thayer. Mm -hmm. And Thayer's client was Mickey Rosner. Right. So Thayer was the one who suggested Mickey Rosner be part of this go-between thing, look into the underworld. Yeah. No, Berg does says not that. He says Rosner called the Lindbergh home. Well, Not as though they contacted him. They said Rosner contacted Lindbergh. It's a whole different dynamic. He a whole different dynamic. Right. 
yeah he doesn't he doesn't deal with the kidnapping very uh, well uh, at all uh well i think he deals with he deals with it well in showing that it was richard hauptman who was the criminal he deals with it in a in a so-called great way that way um he's got burke has on the night of the kidnapping he has he has the determination that night in the bedroom with the kidnap note that it was written um he said the handwriting positioning of the dollar sign and spelling all suggested someone of european origin probably german or scandinavian he knows berg knows that we all know hauptman and 99 percent of the population believes it was hauptman and he is supporting that belief yeah. he is helping that belief then next he says then next he says even to the untrained eye the extension ladder was revealing crude but cunning don't we all when we think if 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 hauptman was the person responsible that the ladder would be crude but cunning that wasn't he always always shown as a cunning man and then to top it off berg says this on page 300 while inspecting while hauptman was inspecting the broom closet i put broom closet in he said berg said it for damage he discovered the forgotten shoe box which he opened only to discover forty thousand dollars in gold certificates he doesn't know what he said berg don't read yeah he knows what he's doing i think he's He's putting, he wants to put Hauptman in yes, yes. electric. I, 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 he the, knows what he's doing. This is, yes. this is scurrilous writing. It's well, terrible. It's family authorized. What do you expect? Yes. There's no skepticism whatsoever in Berg's book. None at all. It's just. No, he uh, knows who did it. And he's going to, he's going to say it's. it's yeah. yeah. But people, so here's, because of Melsky. Ronell, yeah, yeah. I've got to find it in my papers here. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. Michael Melsky. So now we'll go on to oh what we've what I've discovered in Kennedy's book. Michael Melsky, volume one, page Roman numeral 10. I've always personally believed someone hired others to assist with a crime. Is this Michael speaking? Yes. Uh -huh. So I have just, I went, I went back to Berg's book and Lisa Perlman's book. Well, it's like night and day. You can't even rely on, on Berg for the- No, they've got the same story. They have the same which, story. Which part? Do you know that? Well, okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about, only, only Lisa Perlman has talked about this. Yeah. Both Anne, this is on her, in her book on page 64. Both Anne and Charles attended, okay, we'll start the paragraph, sorry. As a new mother, Anne fretted over parenting decisions for little Charlie. So we're talking about when Charlie was just a real baby before the kidnapping. Yeah, yeah. Both Anne and Charles attended the third decennial conference on child health and protection in Washington, DC in November, 1930. Okay, so the baby from June to November. So he's six months old or so sponsored by the white house sponsored by the white house of course because hoover was president he was a eugenicist mm -hmm. henry breckenridge was both on the planning committee and chair of the legislation in physical education committees mm -hmm. henry's wife socialite ada de acosta, acosta breckenridge was assistant director of public information. 
the Breckenridges counted themselves among the elite who enthusiastically promoted eugenics. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, now Ada Breckenridge has a son, Oren Root, O-R-E-N. Right. Burke conveniently doesn't talk about who was at the Lindbergh home the weekend of the kidnapping right. that Saturday and Sunday. Right. But the Breckenridges were there. Right. And and Ada's daughter, Alva, was there. I think I've got her not her name right. Her name is Alva. She often babysit for the family. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Now here we go. This is my this is my new chart. Oh my God. What is it? Melsky's quotes on the top. Okay. I've always personally believed someone hired others to assist. That's Melsky's uh, phrase. In other words, he's not quoting anybody. That's his personal view. Right. I agree with that. So I've got Lindbergh at the beginning as planning the whole deal. I have Henry Breckenridge here, but now in the past two days, I've added Ava. or root i should have brought I, this should be root not breckenridge oh. this is or and root well he's the son his lineage is i don't know a thing about well or and root this this particular or and root uh started uh he became a leftist he was writing for the nation magazine i think it's him or his father wait, wait this would be ada's stepson ada's son Oh, she gave birth to this son through her husband, who was Orin Root II. This must be Orin Root, because, wait a minute, there are a bunch of roots. It's a very long lineage of statesmen, uh, his, historical figures in that family. Oh, okay. I, I can this, imagine. This is the one who becomes a socialist, this Orin Root, her son. Okay. Uh, okay. Or is it her husband? No, it would have been her son. He wrote okay. for the magazine. He was pro Roosevelt. He was, uh, you know, I I looked into it a long time ago and I've forgotten. So you're putting him as part of the cabal that killed the baby that took the baby away. I don't, I don't know. But okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Here's <laughs> okay. Because you you're saying that they're all eugenicists, but I wouldn't put him in that category since he was if i'm i might be wrong in that he's not that it was her husband i, I don't necessarily say he was a eugenicist but he, I say he's, he's really, a friend of he i don't think he was really there they woke him up in the middle of the night to find that way so who knows if that's all telling the truth or if you know agatha christie wrote that book where they're all in on it together what was it called um something on the Nile or the train, uh, uh, the Orient Express. That the movie. Orient Express, they, right. Yeah. yeah, where they're all part of the cabal. Uh, well, anyway, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm sorry I'm okay. interrupting you. There, you so know. the kidnapping happened Tuesday night. They found, they discovered the baby missing at 10, Betty, oh, we'll go backwards. Betty discovered the baby missing at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Now, about 1025, the phone calls went out. First, um, really? It didn't happen right away? No, no, about 1025. Um, because Lindbergh had to get his rifle first, remember? And then he had then he had to send um Ollie Waitley out to Hopewell to get a flashlight. But there is a list of the phone calls in the museum at the archive. Yeah, the first know. one was Ollie Waitley uh -huh. calling so, the Hopewell police. At 1025? Oh. Yes. And then Lindbergh's first phone call was to Henry Breckenridge. Right. <laughs> His second phone call was to the New Jersey State Police. Right. That's about 1025. Now, the news on the media did not get out immediately. 
correct? It couldn't have. I don't know. I never both, into that, but both Berg and Lisa Perlman say that Oren Root came back to his dorm and was told the Lindbergh baby had been kidnapped. Hmm. Okay, the year is 1932. Princeton University, right. Princeton Town. What is Oren Root doing coming back to his dorm at minimally 11 o'clock at night? What is open? The dorm must be open if he went inside. The dorm is open. What's open in Princeton? What has he been doing till approximately- well, They woke him up according to what I- No, no, no. He got back to his dorm at, and heard the news. Uh, oh, he said that in a statement? I don't know what- both Berg, No, both Berg and Lisa Perlman yeah. say Oren Root got back to his dorm and what was cleaning on it. What is the, so he got back to the dorm. Why would you go back when there's a kidnapping going on over there? Is no, no, he didn't find out till he got to the dorm that there was a kidnapping. Oh, 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 oh. oh but, but the, the thing that's, a, well, Ogren and Monier say that they woke him up because they, they got lost in the middle of the night. No, no. Yeah, I okay, but they did run it out, they did. Okay, but we're not there yet. We're not there. Oh. You're wondering where Oren Root was. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, why he's out that night till 11 o'clock at night. Maybe he had a lover. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I, so I'm saying, I'm saying it's fishy. Okay. We're also saying all these nights that Lindbergh went out in the middle of the night in disguise as a police officer, trooper, were fishy too. So we have to say something's fishy, okay? Yeah. There's but nothing Lisa, open in Princeton. Lisa Perlman, maybe, uh, I don't know. I haven't looked into it myself, actually. But because of my website, I get uh, comments from a lot of people uh, who are critical of Lisa Perlman's statements that Lindbergh was out three nights in a row or the dates that she gives for him being out are not, um, they're not, um, I, I don't know, because I didn't check up on this, but other people are telling me that she's wrong about it. And well, it, if she's wrong, then Berg is wrong too, because they both we, say we it. Shouldn't even, I, we shouldn't even read Berg for the kidnapping information. Okay, okay, he, but let's he, just say that he was actually out and didn't get back to the dorm till 11. And I'm asking, so where was he? I don't then know. he's told when he gets to the dorm that the baby has been kidnapped. Oh, says Oren Root, that can't be true. That's just, they're always saying that. Anyway, Anne and the baby were going back to Englewood anyway on Monday. So no. So he goes into his dorm room and he falls fast asleep. Then his parents come and wake him, pound on his door and wake him up, mm -hmm. and they all three go to Hopewell. Now you're reminding me of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I say Oren Root was doing. Oh, uh oh. He drove to the Hopewell house. Yeah. He drove, he got the baby through somehow, I think, from oh. Violet Sharp, who was standing outside the window. Oh, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> he gets the baby from Violet Sharp and he takes the baby to the Princeton Rockefeller Institute and takes the baby to Alexis Carell, then goes to his dorm and hears the baby that the baby is kidnapped. And, oh, no, that can't be. They're always saying stuff like that in the press. No. And anyway, Anne and the baby always go back on Monday morning. So he's gotten his job accomplished. So he goes to bed and he's sound asleep when Henry and Ada, his father, his mother and stepfather come to wake him up so they can, he can direct them to Hopewell. He knows very, very, very well 
how to get to Hopewell in the middle of the night. They've been to Hopewell, but he knows the way exactly. So you're you're presenting us today with a new suspect that nobody's ever pointed a finger at ever. <laughs> He's brand so, new in our uh, list, Ronell. Orin Root from Princeton. Uh, he's a young kid. He's what, 18, 19 years? 20, he's 21. He's 21. Yeah. Yeah. He And he's enamored of Lindbergh. And Lindbergh says, we can do, let's do this together. Oren doesn't know if it's a prank or what. He doesn't know. He knows Lindbergh has pulled pranks on his mother. Well. He knows that. Well. He's in it. He's just a college kid. And maybe he's offered a few bucks. I can't agree with you at all. I, I in a, but listen, everybody's got a theory, so this is very interesting because nobody's ever pointed to Aaron Root ever. Uh, so go ahead with your chart. So you've got Lindbergh. Oh well, I'm sorry that I have two Breckenridges. It should be Root. So of course we got Lindbergh, Henry Breckenridge, Aaron Root, Fish question mark. We don't understand Fish. He's an enigma. We've got, sorry, but I've got Violet. I do love Violet Sharp, but I think she was pulled into it by Lindbergh and didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. And what about Jopsy's uh, uh, an eel. We can't get our hands on this guy. We can't, we, we don't know anything. I mean, your theory, my theory, someone, the man in the moon's theory, it's all... We have no proof of anything unless they actually allow DNA testing of the latter. Oh. Or the well, anyway, go ahead. So you so so in in your theory, and and nobody comes up with theories. You're one of the few who will actually say what they think might have happened, but you can't prove it. And it's all, you know, none of us can prove who can prove. Lisa Perlman can't even prove it. She tried. Yeah, you book. know, Lisa Perlman did the most amazing job ever. Her book should win every book prize for but the you year. Don't find, you don't find things that are wrong in her book. There's so many. Uh, wrong. Well, it's a great book because it's. Uh, she did a lot of research and so oh, much. It, oh. it, For Lisa Perlman to figure out that Lindbergh, the night of the kidnapping, only ran the bath water but did not take a bath. Well, she did all know that. Who knows that? How does she, she know that? It? Well, she oh, deduced it. say the exact same thing in their book from 1993. That's exactly what they say. He went in the bathroom, ran the water, and then took the baby out the window while the water was. That's what they said in 93. So oh, okay. Okay. Out. Then they're brilliant too, because I think that's incredible to figure that out. But, but I don't know that even Algren and Monier were presenting it as a possibility. Okay. They say, who knew that whether Lindbergh took a bath or didn't take a bath? We don't know. We don't, we know nothing except the statements that Lindbergh made and the statements his wife made and the the the, the butler and the 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 servants we only can put together a scenario from people's statements and boy oh boy between the press making stuff up and the the cops and the, the I, detectives it's it's mind boggling how anybody doesn't lose their mind studying this case Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, maybe it shows in me that I think Oren Root was part of it. <laughs> maybe I've well, lost my mind. Up with him as a suspect, I don't think. V uh, Violet Sharp, a lot of people have mentioned her all the time. She's yeah. uh, mentioned, as you know, in a lot of people's theories that she was uh, involved somehow. I don't believe that. But um what was I going to say? So Oren Root is a new uh, category. I never Orin thought. Oren Root's a new category in my story. Why not Alva? Why don't you have Alva, the other daughter, in in as one of the perpetrators or 
you know, you need well, to Well, should I say, I think it's a difference, male, female. She had been a babysitter for the baby. Right. I think Lindbergh could only carry it so far. I think a 21 year old college kid might be up for a prank. The kid, uh, obviously Oren Root had a car. Okay, so and what you're saying, let me see if I have it correctly. You believe that the child was killed because he there was something wrong with him and eugenically speaking, he didn't fit in with the perfection that Lindbergh expected of his of a child with his own name. Let's not forget the child who disappeared and turned up dead had the name of this superhero who has a stained glass window in a church, for goodness sake. Hello. Right? So exactly. You, right. So let's get the people understanding what you're trying to say, that you understand, like many people who read about this, that Lindbergh believed in eugenics, the idea I explained earlier, master race theory, um, uh, and for that reason, Lindbergh had to either put his child in a home. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that that's not the real child? You believe that the corpse was actually Charlie Jr., right? Who else had the scalloped shirt on that Betty Gow had made with the blue thread? Right, but that could have been manipulated. You could you could hear somebody saying, yeah, but it yeah, doesn't. They can, you can go ahead and someone can go ahead and say that. But then I go ahead and say, no, the the, the corpse was the baby. Let's right, I agree. Over that. It wasn't it wasn't Harold Olson and it wasn't Kevin Kerwin. Right. I, yeah. Or a baby from Skillman Epileptic Center. Right. Let's face it. It was the baby. OK. Right. It looked like him because the face, like Lisa Perlman, yeah. uh, one of the things in her book that was very interesting to me is that the face was not as deteriorated as the rest of the body so that it could be recognizable when it was found. Right. I think she's on to something with that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to go. Yeah. We have to go with the fact that it was the baby. It yeah. was the baby. It looked yeah. like him. The hair was the same. And uh, the shirt, you're right. But you can hear echoes of people challenging this, right? And I yeah. think it should have been challenged in the courtroom to at least get Hauptman out of the predicament. He was in his lawyer. As we all know, uh, Riley said, well, we're not contesting that that's the trial. Well, wait a minute. Your client could have walked out of the trial out of the courthouse if you did challenge it, but he never did. Riley never challenged the identity of the corpse when even Van Ingen, the, the, the child's pediatrician said, if you gave me a million dollars, I couldn't tell you that that was the child I examined only two weeks before he went missing. So there was so much that Riley didn't do, but let's get back to what you're saying. So what were you what was I asking I forgot what I was trying to ask you okay so we agree so you believe the child was Charlie and that uh Lindbergh was either purposely or because of a prank right purposely and, not not a prank but he okay. he was good at pranking so he could he I fooled could, people into thinking I see where you're going he would have been great building a ladder he that would the, the ultimate prank build a ladder to make it good well i don't know how many people know this but the one person in this whole story who we know built ladders was charles limber not Hauptman. nobody can point to a ladder that Hauptman ever built but we can point to several ladders that Lindbergh either made for his wife when she was pregnant and couldn't climb into this serious uh, by herself as a child on the farm, he built all kinds of contraptions out of wood that looked like ladders. Yeah, so I, I think the ladder was built for this particular prank or kidnapping, whatever you believe it is. I call so, I call it an abduction is what yeah, I call it. Well, that's a good word to use. So you think that he could have talked a young guy at Princeton into helping him do what? With Violet Sharp, do what? Oren Root was the driver. Take the baby to the Princeton Rockefeller Center. Oh, where Lisa 
locates the place where they're going to do the vivisection on the child to, to I forgot what she's saying, to what were they doing the vivisection for? To, to take his, his organs for posterity? I don't remember what, I know she thinks that they murdered the child by experimenting on him. Isn't that what she says? Right? Well, that's what they were all about. Oh, I mean, the child was not a normal child. Maybe they were trying to figure out what had gone wrong with the that's baby. What I thought, you know, that's one of the yeah. things that I thought. But whatever they were doing, I guess we have to wince and say, maybe we don't want to know what they were doing with the baby. We want to know who did it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right in that there were other people involved for sure. Melsky, you're quoting Melsky there. I agree a hundred percent. It wasn't yeah. like, because Augur and Ammonia have him being the lone prankster with the lone guilt and the lone, everything is just Lindbergh and no one else. But of course, most of us think there were a lot of people involved in, in the cover up and in the actual yeah. So you've got Oren Root. What about his mother? Do you think Ida Aida Aida Breckenridge was knowledgeable about any of this? I doubt it. I doubt it. I think Henry Breckenridge was well into it. I think Anne was left out, and I think Breckenridge's wife were left out. Completely left out. In fact, Lindbergh closed his door whatever that weekend when the Breckenridges were there and had a private chat with Henry. Yeah, I know. That's in the in the diary, somebody's diary. All of this, well, we don't really know, do we? No, we don't, Ronell. But uh, we don't run L, so we're just but but well I was saying Lisa Perlman got has has got I'm I'm just convinced that she has it nailed that it was Lindbergh, the perpetrator. Yeah, I agree. What I want Lisa Perlman to do is to come up with his helpers. Who was in on this well, with that's Lindbergh? interesting because I never thought that Breckenridge was knowledgeable before the event. I thought he got roped in like Jaffsey. In my opinion, Jaffsey got roped in. Henry Breckenridge slowly got roped in as his lawyer and friend. But with Lisa Perlman's book, I had to change my mind because she convinced me that Breckenridge had to have known earlier that this was going to take place. So you Yes. They yeah. plotted together and and Breckenridge could easily see that something was wrong with the baby. He understood Lindbergh's need to have something have this baby disappear in some way shape or form but Henry know, Breckenridge was in on this this is why Lindbergh the first phone call Lindbergh made was to his lawyer now I'll tell you what if I had a child missing I would not call Andy Dutcher Andy Dutcher our lawyer would tell us uh Nancy dear um, I think this is an issue for you to call the police. I, I can't help you with my lawyer skills tonight at midnight, Nancy. Um, do you mind if you hang up and leave me alone for a while? I'm sorry that you've got a child missing, but I like I drop wills and I do that kind of stuff. Uh, come on. He calls he calls Breckenridge. You know, we have to go through these books and say every single time, I smell a fish. <laughs> I smell a fish. I do not understand why Oren Root is in Princeton on a Tuesday night and he gets, doesn't get back to his dorm until like 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I smell a fish. But there's and nothing. Says, oh, no. Wouldn't he be panicky? If someone told them the news is out that the Lindbergh baby's been because kidnapped. They've been, no, because the newspapers are always making stuff up all the time. And it was never made up the kidnap story about the baby. 
No, but but imagine you're Oren Root and you were there that weekend and you were with everybody and the baby was there and everyone was together. And now somebody in the dorm is telling you, hey, did you hear the Lindbergh kidnapping? Uh, Lindbergh baby was kidnapped. You would say to yourself, OK, there there goes the press again. There goes the rumors. You wouldn't I, I could understand why he would discount it. And not... He would discount it because he was part of it. Well, there was his he, way of. Uh, so if he was, he part couldn't of... say he couldn't say. Oh, I knew that. Well, I if... mean, because I drove the. He couldn't say I drove the baby to Princeton. You idiot. But if you think he was part of it, you're going to have to come up with some better. You're going to have to come up with the reasoning that you're offering, the explanation for why you think he's part of it. Isn't isn't sound enough for anybody to go well to to think that he might have been part of it? Just Here's what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm offering this idea to someone who's way smarter than me. <laughs> I'm giving them a little clue. I'm saying to the to the folks out there, think about Or and Root and see what you can come up with because I think we have an a germ of an idea here. I mean, There's no reason this is kid is out on Tuesday night in 1932 at 11 o'clock at night. Well, and when he hears the kid was the baby was the child was kidnapped, he says, oh, my God, he doesn't go to bed and go to sleep. He calls his parents. Oh, yeah, that's what yeah. he did. He I didn't. Don't know, do you do the police must have a statement? I'll check. Do you have a statement to the police? There must be a not statement. to the police. No, I got. I've got to get myself. They interviewed. To they interviewed everybody, but actually, I don't think I've ever seen a statement of Alva Root. She was the boy's babysitter. She should have been interviewed. First of all, with the baby, that's another issue because I really don't see anything wrong with the kid. You know, there, there's no sound with that video, and he looks normal to me. So he's got a very big head, a big forehead. His fontanel, we know now, was open. That's not a good sign. He had a slight uh, rickety condition. His, uh, what else? I don't know. So whatever was wrong with him, maybe it wasn't observable. Maybe it was something else. Like uh, my theory is epilepsy. Because of the, uh, she was seven months pregnant when they flew across the country. And we don't know what happened on that trip. So anyway, okay. So I, I think that's what was wrong with him. I'm convinced that was what was wrong with him. Lisa Perlman uh, um, claims that it's hydrocephalus that because his head was too large and all. And no, no, no. Do, do, you have to trace it back to why did he have rickets? Right, right. And the, uh, a millionaire's child we know doesn't have rickets. No. Steve Romeo said to me in a previous video that uh, all rich children had, uh, that it was common for rich children to have rickets because in those days they didn't put vitamins in the food. But that's not a good enough answer. Um, he had no, no, no. sunshine. And he had Figure a... out what causes rickets. Phenobarbital causes right. rickets. Right, that's what I think. Right, yeah. the epilepsy. And they, they did uh, establish their estate on the border of the biggest epileptic center. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of okay. ironic, isn't it? Yeah. So, okay, so you've got... Uh, okay, I agree Henry Brackenridge was involved with Lindbergh knowledgeably he wasn't talked to he wasn't roped into it no uh, and because I did believe that when I read Algren and Monier I figured well Lindbergh committed the crime and then he got his lawyer to help him and then the lawyer has um an oath of silence you know lawyers cannot absolutely speak. yeah uh priest yeah, and later on in the 40s, there was a big breakup between the two of them, you know. Yes. Spoke, and uh, Breckenridge, I have a copy of it from Columbia University. They did interviews, or, oral interviews. Uh, I don't think I, it's not, I don't think there's a tape of it, but I have the paper 
pages and pages of uh, Breckenridge's life and Breckenridge's family, not a word. He doesn't even mention the name Lindbergh even once. It is so, wow. so, and the interviewer doesn't, I think you can find it online at Columbia University. I have a copy of it somewhere. And he's interviewed, I mean, Columbia University did these interviews with famous people of the 40s and 50s and I uh, forgot what it's called, but you can find it on online. The finding aid is there. <laughs> and, okay. and he doesn't mention Lindbergh's name. And every time you see, uh, even on Wikipedia, if you look up Henry Breckenridge's name, it'll mention no connection. It will wow. mention Lindbergh, but he personally never talks about Lindbergh. They had a breakup. Anne mentions it. Uh, in one of her diaries as her husband lent him money. You know, he ran against Roosevelt. So I guess it was in Roosevelt's second administration or third, I don't know. Henry Breckenridge ran for president for a very short time. And Lindbergh, Anne says, my husband gave him money and they had an argument and they never spoke again. I don't believe that's the reason that they never spoke. Something else went between the two of them and I have no idea what it could have been. Yeah, right. Other than this, this. So you think Jaffsey getting to your plan, the thing you hold it up again? Okay, sure. Violet Sharp and so and Fish. So how how did all these people know each other to be involved together in a cabal? How did you get them all on the same page? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Fish, especially, because he's the big mystery man. Oh, Nancy, you froze. Froze. Money cheap. Oh, you your voice froze, so I don't. I cannot hear you. There, you're back. Okay. 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 Sorry. Um, did was fish completely? My on my internet connection is unstable. Saying. Um, fish, I don't know. I can't figure fish out. I don't know that anyone can, but he had he had the money. Did he buy it at a pool hall? Um, Violet Sharp, she would not have taken her life for no reason. She wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. She was peripherally involved. She didn't know what was happening. She was told by Lindbergh, my heart goes out to Violet Sharp. My mm -hmm. heart goes out to her and her sister and her mother. And Jopsy is as weaselly as a person as we've ever known. Should we do another another chat on on Jopsy? Yeah. Oh, and how about seventy if, parts on Jopsy? <laughs> if how about if Anne and and Charles have a second child, and yes, after six months they finally come upon a great name for him. They'll name him John. Isn't that something? Give me a break. It's so astonishing that they named him John without the H, but nevertheless, it's Who still- Who cares? They're still saying the word John. It comes across as John. I get John Condon and Cemetery John out of that. Yeah. Well, Man. I think Jaffsey figured it out, but I don't think he was involved in anything. I, I have Jaffsey as as- somebody who was used as a patsy or they used him as a go-between. See, my whole point in all of this is if your son is missing and you're the big hero who's got stained glass figures of yourself <laughs> in churches, what do you need a go-between for? What's the purpose of a go-between? You, you, Lindbergh was a sharpshooter. He had a million guns. He loved guns. He had rifles. Why He could shoot he was a better shot than any, probably any guy. He, he doesn't even decide to go into the stupid cemetery on his own. Exactly. He went into the courthouse in Flemington with a gun. Exactly. So, hello, go into St. Raymond's with a gun. The whole thing is like a comedy drama or some. Uh, and, and we're all crazed about this. Yeah, he. that's why you cannot read Berg 
to learn anything about because he's only parroting what other people have written in this their books that he's are not all his own stories to make Lindbergh look good. Well, he had to include the kidnapping because you can't write a book. Yeah, right. You can't pretend it didn't happen, but well, you can't ignore it. You have. Yeah, but to you really. It. But can you say that that Richard Hauptman had forty thousand dollars of gold certificates? Well, that's what the trial said. That's no, no, they said fourteen thousand six hundred dollars. No, they 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 said at the end, they had these lying people from the Treasury Department that added up all the money that Hauptman had, and it was within a nickel or two. Of yeah, the, but that he had spent, but yeah. not what they had found. Oh, well, Berg doesn't have that. look. He he didn't. You can Well, he's just trying to incriminate who our friend Bruno Hauptman, well, Richard. He he was just parroting the the case as it's accepted by I guess, the family. Uh, that you know, if my last thought here, right now, when we're talking about this, <laughs> is that I think I actually think that this book that says Lindbergh on the cover is not. We already knew when Berg wrote this book in 1998. We knew everything we needed to know about this man who had flown for 33 and a half hours and did almost nothing else. He wrote it about the kidnapping after Algren and Muneer to make sure we understood that it was Richard Hauptman who did the kidnapping, not Lindbergh. This was the family's response to the algren Muneer book from 1993. No. No, I'll tell you why. Because they hired him in, uh, Algren and Monier wrote that book and they published it in 93. But that was five years after they gave Scott Berg the um, authority to go to Sterling Library at Yale. He he spent 10 years on this book. So Algren and Monier- So they tell us. So they, I'm not sure I believe it. No, no, they did. No, they, 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 they went to Fort Myers to Jim Newton's house. He was still alive at the time, and they all got together. The children were there, Anne and Reeve, and Anne was not mentally incapacitated at the time, and they chose Scott Berg as their authorized uh, biographer, and they gave him permission. They opened up the, you know, they gave him permission well, to go to Yale and. Okay. And Algren maybe, and Munier, maybe in the midst of this, then in 1993, when he read the Algren and Munir book, he decided right. he better he better clear clear Lindbergh's exactly. name. Exactly. Sure, he tells the world that this was Bruno Richard Hauptman. Who, what you're bringing up is important. Kidnap the child. Yeah, you noticed this. That's interesting that you figured this out because. Right. He he is writing this book. It took him nine okay. years. And in the middle of his uh, research or whatever the, he was doing to write this uh, thousand page book that he got the Pulitzer for, by the way, you're you're alluding to the fact that we already knew everything. And basically, his book doesn't reveal anything new about Lindbergh that people did not know. He got the Pulitzer for writing a book that we could have, I mean, you know, it could be well written and all that, but we already knew everything in there pretty much. But <laughs> the thing about the the back behind the scenes is that it infuriated me. In 1998, when this book came out, Algren and Monier had been out for five years already, right? And he yes. did not mention them once. And I came to the Miami Book Fair where he appeared. And I stood up at the microphone because I sat next to the mic to make sure because Scott Berg only took two or three questions. And I knew that. And he was, I had to be there to ask him this. And I asked him, how come you wrote a book about Lindbergh? You included the kidnapping and you didn't even mention Algren and Monier. And then I said something about their theory and the audience just gasped because nobody, 500 people had never heard 
that Lindbergh might have been the culprit and they gasped. Oh, okay. They and and Scott Berg, he didn't respond to that question because I then asked him, were you family authorized? Did they have, uh, did the Lindbergh family uh, pressure you for what you, uh, forgot how I put it, did they, uh, it's a family authorized book and did they pressure you about what you wrote? And he was enraged. He didn't ever answer the question about all ammonia, which I knew he read because it was on his bookshelf. Every photograph of Scott Berg in, in uh, Time and Newsweek, wherever he was, he was in his library with the books behind him. And there were all ammonia's book. I saw it. I saw it. That's and great detective him. work on your part, Ronald. In the book, he, it's out for five years. You know, you're bringing- To pretend it doesn't exist. Right. The most groundbreaking idea in the history of this kidnapping is that Algren and Monier decided that based on today's type of investigation, Lindbergh had never been cleared. His The suspicion of the father and mother is the first thing police do. And Berg never, like you're revealing here, how he wrote about the kidnapping, it's- ludicrous and it's a whitewash and he doesn't deal with it honestly he really doesn't and i was angry and uh what can you do when you find out that the family hired him um you're freezing up i'm sorry he he was in a tight spot um but what a great educator you were at that people learn more from you ronnell than they did from scott berg oh i hope so because scott berg had he had to do what he had to do. He, you know. Yeah, they could. What did they need to listen to Scott Berg for? They could all read his book and and read that stuff. You gave them. You gave them something huge to ponder right now. Good for you. Good be, for you. Yeah, because we all know about Jean Benet Ramsey. Everybody suspects the parents, and uh, every time something Scott happened, Scott Yard said. Yeah, Scotland, Scotland Yard oh. said, it, well, look at the parents first. Yeah. Did they say it at the time, do you know? They said it in 1932, I think they- Yes, did. they did say it at the time. Yeah. Well, I'm real- yeah, They knew it, but Scot Scotland Yard- I'm fascinated by your theory because you've never told me this before. So it's complete surprise that you've got Fish, uh, Violet, Jaffsey, and Oren Root, mixed up with Henry and Charles. Anybody else you want to yep. throw in there? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm working on it, Ron L. <laughs> okay, so we'll hear more. We'll, we've got to do um we've got to do the Kennedy book, more of it. You're frozen. Okay. We've got to do Great. The yeah. next time in the Okay. All right. Awesome. You'll take notes. Okay. This book makes me so angry. I'm infuriated. Oh, it's it, it just guts you, doesn't it? It's just yeah. um, every page is like makes you angrier and sadder. Right, right. Because the yeah. Yeah. so we'll we'll tell everybody about that the uh, okay. community book next time. So have a great time. If you want to dip in my pool here, yes, I want to go to Cuenavaca in Mexico. Okay. I'll call yeah. Southwest Airlines and see if I can get a cheap flight this afternoon. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. Okay. Now. Good. Thanks, Amelia. That was fun, Ronnell. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. No. Stop recording. <laughs>